Welcome to Economics Matters. This is a podcast focusing on uh, uh, international and domestic uh, politics, economics, cultural affairs, and uh, society uh, in general. And uh, we're really happy to have our two guests here today, uh, Yuval Steinitz and uh, Eitan Shashinsky. And with that, I'll uh, give it to Larry so he can uh, give a, a better and fuller introduction. Great. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Alex is my uh, son. Uh, he's uh, a uh, has a, a degree from Oberlin College in uh, in politics and has a lot of knowledge about history and geopolitics. And as he said, we're going to be focused in this uh, podcast on uh, economics, global economics, domestic economics, and personal economics, the personal finance. So we're covering all the bases. And uh, today, I'm delighted that we have two of the uh, leading uh, uh, Israeli uh, policymakers, and in Eitan Shinsky's case, uh, leading academic um, economists um, with us to discuss the future of the Middle East and uh, some broader topics like what's going on in the Ukraine and the prospects for uh, for the Chinese to invade uh, Taiwan. And all these things obviously feed back onto the economy. I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, first Eitan and then uh, Yuval. Um, Eitan Shashinsky is my very close friend, uh, and Alex is a very close friend, family friend uh, for decades. Um, uh, he's uh, arguably the top economist in Israel. He's a professor emeritus at Hebrew University in Jeru uh, of Jerusalem. He received his BA um, and MA at, in economics and statistics at Hebrew U, and then he got a PhD in economics from MIT. And he's been doing work uh, even uh, to this day. He's a little bit, a um, uh, uh, little on the older side, uh, but I, I think he's still just starting out from the from observing his productivity. But he's working on pensions, tax issues, social insurance, annuities, uh, behavioral public economics, boundary rationality. So he's just a brilliant nonstop economist. Uh, He's visited all kinds of top uh, universities at the, uh, in the U.S. and around the world. He's a member of many top um, uh, academic institutions like the American Academy, the Swedish Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, Econometrica Society. He's got a doctorate degree from Stockholm School of Economics. The, the key, I think, interesting thing for, uh, for non-economists is that Eitan uh, was uh, appointed to head two critical committee commissions one to oversee how Israel would uh, use its uh, newly discovered deposits of gas in the um, in the Mediterranean, and also how to uh, to uh, harvest um, natural resources in the Dead Sea. So the the committees that were set up that and he he led uh, are referred to in the press by Shishinsky one and Shishinsky two, and they led to two two laws, which I believe were called Shashinsky 1 and Shashinsky 2, at least informally. So if you use the name Shashinsky around uh, Israel, everybody knows uh, who we're talking about. Eitan also uh, was board of director, uh, the chairman of the board of directors of Core Industries, which, uh, which is a very large uh, conglomerate of companies in Israel and Sagat Investment House, who's also uh, on the board of directors. So very important uh, Guy in Israel, and then we have uh, Yuval uh, Steinitz, uh, who has an equally impressive uh, vita. He uh, served as Israel's uh, finance minister during the global economic crisis from 2009 to 2013. He's been the minister of intelligence and strategic affairs between 2013 and 2015. Minister of energy between 2015 and 2021. Uh, member of the security cabinet from. Uh, for a long time here, 2009 to 2021, he was elected to the Knesset of the Israeli parliament in 1999. And uh, he, he became chairman of the Defense and Foreign Affairs Committee in 2003. So he's been involved in intelligent issues, intelligence issues, overseeing uh, uh, different intelligent organizations in um, Israel for really decades now. Uh, and before he got into politics, he was uh, working in um, philosophy. He was an associate professor at Haifa University in philosophy. And I think he's written two books, uh, best-selling books in uh, on Israeli history uh, and uh, 
uh, I guess, philosophies. But anyway, well, we may hear some more about those books. But I want to start us off by talking about the um, uh, the current uh, world global energy crisis and get your quick reactions to where you think uh, energy prices are going uh, and what role that can Israel play in uh, alleviating this global crisis, especially for for Europe, uh, for Western Europe, given the, uh, the fact that Russia is uh, off and on turning on the gas to um, to Europe, and uh, there's a boycott of Russian gas that's uh, in place, it's supposed to occur in the fall. So take it away. Uh, Eitan, give us your quick reaction, and then we'll move to you all. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Alex. And uh, let me start by saying that Israel is, is a potential player, though not perhaps on the world scene as significant as countries such as Russia and so forth. We'll get to that. Uh, let me backtrack uh, for a moment. Israel, around the year 2000, uh, um, new findings of offshore gas were found in Israel, offshore in Israel. Uh, after the American Geological Survey uh, already predicted that the Eastern Mediterranean is a, has a potential for gas and oil. And so some deposits of gas offshore in deep water were found in Israel. Uh, the uh, first, uh, a relatively small one, which was already exhausted. Uh, uh, and the second one, Tamar, was about uh, uh, 300, 250, 300 billion cubic meters. And then a much larger one, Leviathan, Leviathan uh, was about, who is now around 600 billion cubic meters. All in all, Israel has about a trillion cubic meters of gas, uh, uh, proven reserves of gas uh, offshore uh, in the deep, in deep water. And Israel has been extracting Israel needs for its own consumption, not more than about, I would say, 20 million cubic meters a year. So we are definitely an, a potential exporter of gas, uh, which we are doing uh, to a small scale also to neighboring countries and neighboring, the, even the Palestinian Authority takes a small amount of uh, natural gas. Jordan uh, needs Israel and is, is relying on Israel for gas. But uh, more, more, more to the point, uh, uh, worldwide is Israel's export of gas to Egyptian uh, uh, offshore, uh, uh, Egyptian liquefaction plants, two liquefaction plants, uh, which have been uh, not been fully utilized and Israel is exporting gas to those liquefaction plants. The gas is liquefied in Egypt and then shipped to uh, uh, Europe and to the Far East from that point. Uh, potentially there are more, uh, they have been talking and Yuval will talk about it because he pursued that issue quite extensively uh, about the pipeline from Israel uh, uh, to uh, through perhaps Northern Cyprus to uh, Greece. Uh, Turkey would have been a natural uh, uh, target for uh, a pipeline from, Egypt, from Israel given the, uh, the relation, the past uh, relations of Israel with Turkey this was not working out, but it's still economically perhaps the most uh, 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 promising uh, line. So, but to sum it up uh, in short is Israel could be a potential uh, additional uh, source of supply of gas to Europe, which has been looking for to diversify its resources. Uh, you know that for example, Germany you, uh, uh, relies 40 to 50 percent on Russian gas from Gazprom, and given now the Russian-Ukrainian conflict and the sanctions on Russia, Europe was certainly will welcome Israeli uh, Israeli gas uh, uh, being shipped to. to well, let me Europe. let me uh, let me uh, ask you all uh, how much you know under the best of circumstances in the short run, uh, how much of let's say Europe's uh, Western Europe's uh, demand for gas could Israel supply? Is this uh, like a long-term thing or a short? Is there a short-term capacity for Israel to really come in and matter? Depends. It depends about what we shall uh, uh, we shall do with our gas reserve, and whether we will uh, continue exploring our economic water because the prospect is. Uh, the, the scientific evaluation is that we discovered only about 30% uh, 
of, uh, of, of the natural gas. So if we will be able to, to proceed uh, exploring the Eastern Mediterranean, the Israeli economic water, uh, it seems very likely that we will be able to double or even to triple the amount of natural gas from uh, uh, Ethan Shishinsky just mentioned one trillion, which is the current, it's even a little bit above uh, one trillion currently, but it might get to, to something between three and 4,000 uh, BCM, billion cubic meters. And this is really very significant. Uh, Ethan mentioned also that we, uh, uh, that we need the 20 BCM annually for the Israeli market. We hope to be able to consume 20 BCM uh, currently, we are consuming, I think, 13 or 14, uh, but we are increasing our uh, natural gas consumption. So we hope uh, to reach uh, uh, 20 BCM, uh, and therefore we have still already today plenty of gas to export, a uh, very large surplus. But in the future, if exploration will future exploration will take place, and uh, then probably we will have much more to uh, export. The second issue is, of course, uh, uh, the transmission system, because unlike oil, gas is not easy to be uh, to, to be delivered, to be transmitted to long distances, and especially not overseas. So we have uh, 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 three possible channels to export and to increase our export, because as Ethan already mentioned, we are already exporting some gas to Europe uh, via Egypt, via the Egyptian LNG facilities. But in order to increase it, we have three options. One is to build additional pipes to Egypt, which is a short distance, and to double or triple the amount of gas that we can uh, a, a shift from Israel to Egypt and to his uh, Egyptian LNG facilities. This is one channel, very important channel. It's already ongoing. I, I hosted uh, the Egyptian energy minister Tarek El Moula in Israel two years ago, and we concluded an agreement uh, uh, that will pave the way for, for the private sector, for companies to lay down additional pipes, including subsea pipe, and that will go directly from Leviathan, our biggest uh, uh, gas field, uh, to Egypt. The second channel was also mentioned by Ethan. It's a pipe to Turkey, from Israel to Turkey. And then via the Turkish transmission system that is already in place, uh, some of it, a lot of it can go to Europe as well. And the third uh, project, which is very challenging project, but I think very important, is to build a, a, what we call the East Med pipeline, a cross Mediterranean, a subsea pipeline stretching from Israel, taking gas from Israel and Cyprus, from the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, through the Mediterranean directly to uh, Greece and Italy. This is going to be, if it will take place, the longest and deepest uh, 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 subsea uh, gas pipeline in the world, 2,000 kilometers long, uh, three kilometers uh, depth, maximum depth of three kilometers. But I convinced the European Union already five years ago to, to examine it and they uh, spend already $100 million together with the Greek uh, company Poseidon to, to and, and they made feasibility study and the feasibility the results were very good. That this project is technically feasible and also economically feasible. And already initial uh, plan was already also taking place. So we have one channel via Egypt that is already working and we can increase it in the future. And we, if we will be able to build two pipes, one to Turkey and one directly from Israel through the Mediterranean to Greece and Italy, then, and, and with some new exploration maybe, uh, then uh, maybe in the future we can, uh, we can export even 40 BCM annually uh, uh, from Israel to Europe. 40, 50, maybe together with Cyprus or alone. This is already significant. Would this be um, a big share of the Europe's needs? And yeah, it, it, it will be significant. Europe consume currently more than 400 BCM annually. So it's about uh, 10 potentially. So, so this, this, this can amount to, to 15%, 20%, maybe a little bit more from the European overall consumption. 
But I want to add one factor because we see that there is really the, the, the global inflation and, and, and economic problems and maybe, maybe we will be facing a, a, another global crisis, economic crisis soon. Uh, uh, stagflation also. Uh, one of the key factors is, is energy. And the lack of energy in Europe, it's not actually just in Europe. You see it also in China, for example. They are closing factories, hundreds of factories in China, because there they don't have enough natural gas and enough coal, and they don't have enough electricity. So the government of China a few months ago ordered uh, hundreds of factories either to close down or to reduce their uh, production. So it's not just in Europe. Actually, there are two sources to this uh, crisis. The immediate one is, of course, the Russian, uh, the war in the Ukraine and the Russian uh, uh, sanctions and limiting uh, uh, gas export to Europe. But you cannot ignore another factor. And this was, in my view, a very a serious mistake. Uh, many people are saying, and rightly so, that natural gas is like oil and coal. This is a, a fossil uh, fuel. And therefore, if you want to shift the world to renewables and to fight uh, global warming, yeah, and then you have to end up, yeah, to, to, to reduce and, to, and at the end of the way, to terminate the use of coal, oil, and natural gas altogether and to replace them with renewables. And this was the policy of the European Union until one year ago. And it was a very serious mistake because actually, although of course natural gas, which is methane, is, is a, a fossil a fuel, it's totally different from oil and coal. If you are uh, shifting as we are doing in Israel from in our power stations, if you are moving from coal or uh, diesel or oil to natural gas, you reduce 90, between 90 to 95% of air pollution. So this is extremely significant uh, to, the, to, to, to public health. You also reduced 50%, approximately 50%. It depends about, your, uh, about the, the turbine, the system that you are using. You also reduce about 50% of CO2 emission, which is less significant, but still significant. You reduce it by half. Now in Europe, they were so enthusiastic about the shift to, uh, uh, to renewables that they stopped also developing the natural gas system. They stop in some places, not all in Norway they proceed, but in Britain, in Holland, in other places, they were less enthusiastic to explore for natural gas. They were less enthusiastic to invest in natural gas. Uh, and this was a great, a, a big mistake because actually what is going today is that you don't have enough energy. And in many places, because you don't have enough natural gas, you are shifting back to coal. And then therefore you double CO2 yeah, emission. Okay. And you, and you increase dramatically air pollution. So yeah. you have to be very reasonable here. I think that global warming is a very serious challenge and we have to take it very seriously, but we have to be rational. So the European Union, just one year ago, when they realized that this was a terrible mistake, they, uh, they declare again natural gas as they make they made, they, they made the distinction between natural gas and coal and oil, and they reframe natural gas as a green or, or a friendly, uh, surrounding friendly uh, energy. And now they are encouraging again all over Europe uh, development, exploration development of, of, of natural gas uh, fields and also import uh, of natural gas from other places, including Israel. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons to this uh, current crisis was that uh, in a very unwise and unreasonable way, as uh, in Europe, uh, instead of trying to replace coal and oil with natural gas, they were trying at the very same time to, 
to dramatically reduce natural gas and now they're facing enormous problem and okay, Israel can be part of the solution, no doubt about it. Right, so, um, okay, so I think the, the basic picture is Israel can make a big contribution, but it's gonna take a while for this to come on board. Uh, so it's not likely to, uh, to alleviate the crisis that we're facing right now in energy around the world, the short term for crisis. Uh, Alex, do you wanna maybe lead us in a little discussion here about the Ukraine and Russia? And uh, get uh, you all's and, and Aton's perspective on on how that situation, how that conflict is going to evolve, uh, and where their perceptions are of uh, what Putin's objectives are. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's basically the question. I mean, uh, uh, I guess this question is for both of you. Uh, where do you think that this will ultimately end up? Will there be uh, it seems to me that there has to be some sort of negotiated settlement um, where uh, some territory is uh, is uh, designated as Russian, particularly in the east. Um, I don't think that uh, a maximal objective of Ukraine to take back Crimea is really in the cards. Uh, and it seems that a, a negotiated settlement can only really be brokered by uh, you know, a, a major world power such as the United States uh, or China in this case. And I guess a follow-up question to that is, what do you guys think is China's role in prolonging this crisis and uh, their their influence on it? So, Eitan, why don't you go ahead and give your reaction? <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, I think I agree with Alex. Uh, uh, um, is Alex's observation that this conflict will be uh, can be settled by negotiations and a compromise will have to be uh, will have to be some uh, hammered out uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we are not talking about uh, return to the Crimea is is, is a well done is, is is a done is a done fact, but perhaps some compromise also on some eastern. The Luhansk uh, uh, area in eastern Ukraine will also remain, uh, uh, perhaps under uh, some autonomy or Russian uh, uh, dominance. Um, so a, a compromise will have to be, will have to be ha hammered out. I think we are now seeing some war of attrition uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Russia is, of course, much larger and has a more uh, enduring power, and eventually, and the West will also to my mind, uh, 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 will have to be, uh, will come forward to hammer out a compromise. The US will have to lead this. Uh, if I may put in a remark here about past history too, just for the record, I think the US, which is now of course, and, and the world as a whole, of course, is condemning Russia on its aggressive and brutal uh, uh, attack on Ukraine. But let's recall that uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago already, Putin has made some, ha has, has aired some warnings uh, to Ukraine and to the other countries, the ex-Soviet Union uh, uh, republics, not to join NATO. And this was not heeded by the US and by, uh, by the allies, by NATO. And I think it was a grave mistake not to pay attention to the warnings at that time I don't want it to call it more, 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 uh, and more. It was a mistake uh, for sure. That's that will be an understatement. And Duval, so, do you do you agree with that? Mean? I was going to ask Duval. Do you agree with that? Uh, I, I, I completely agree with Ethan's analysis of the situation in uh, Europe in Ukraine. I think it is it is an unnecessary war. It's a, it's a great tra tragedy that could be avoided. I think that uh, Putin demand, Russian demand, that uh, Ukraine will not join NATO. Uh, it, it's reasonable, or at least you can understand it, why from their point of view, they don't want NATO to get so close uh, to Moscow, yeah, because uh, Ukraine is, you know, is, is, is actually, if, if you see the map, uh, Ukraine uh, Eastern uh, border is a few hundred kilometers from Moscow. Uh, maybe maybe they have nothing to fear from, but we remember what happened when, they, when the Russians were trying to put uh, their missiles in Cuba 
a few hundred kilometers from Miami and United States uh, <laughs> took it very seriously. Uh, so you can at least understand it. It's not something that is out of the blue. And I think that settlement can be reached uh, and should be reached because uh, this is really an unnecessary tragedy uh, and uh, enormous suffering mainly of, of, the, of the people in Ukraine. I want to add, to add with your permission, Larry, one point that really uh, concerned me and if, even frightened me. The whole world is now focusing on the Ukraine and last week also on, the, on Taiwan, on the situation around Taiwan. But the key issue, the main issue that will dictate the future of the world is what's going on with Iran, with the Iranian nuclear uh, project. And this is, uh, it seems that uh, this is a, a, at least uh, partially neglected. And this is the most important topic of our time, if Iran will get nuclear. It's not just a devastating threat to Israel and to the entire Middle East, but it will create in a few years time, a very different, in dangerous world, because Iran so will, not, will not stay alone. Other countries, other Muslim uh, regimes in the vicinity, like in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, Algier, and several more will follow immediately. And this will be the end of non-proliferation uh, regime in the world. And uh, we will face a very dangerous world, not just here in the Middle East, but also in the United States, in Europe, and all around. So you've all, all, you know, before uh, we got on tape today, you, you and I and Alex were talking about Iran's uh, 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 efforts to uh, to to take uh, nuclear fuel and um, uh, raise its uh, level of, I, I guess I forget exactly the term, uh, uh, concentration of of uh, of um, uranium. Uh, Iridium uh, up to 60% from what has been historically their limit of 20%. And you said that this has happened in the last uh, last six months, last couple of months? Last, last 12 months, yeah. actually. Last, last 12, 12 months. months. And, yes. and your concern is that the US has not responded at all and is letting this happen and that they can go from 60 to 80, which is the concentration level, which you can make a bomb at. And, uh, do you uh, do you see uh, this just happening? I mean, what do you, how do you see things likely playing? Suppose that they want to do that and they're hell bound on doing that. Uh, do you see the U.S. just sitting back at this point and not and letting that happen and the whole thing evolving in the in the manner you just said, which is everybody goes nuclear in the Middle East? Look, I, 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 it's difficult for me to to, to predict. But I, I, I can tell you uh, what, what I did notice so far. Uh, uh, with or without agreement, Iran never dared to cross the 20% enrichment threshold, right. which is considered to be a medium range at, uh, uranium enrichment. Never, they never dared it. Uh, you know, before the initial agreement, the interim agreement that was signed in November 2013, they already enrich uranium to 20% level, which considered to be a medium level, but they never, although uh, te uh, for, te technically they could do it, they never uh, reached uranium to higher levels than 20%. Why? Because there was, a, they, 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 there was a credible military threat by the United States of America, and the main factor in Iran is not the sanctions. The sanctions are also, of course, important, are uh, adding to the pressure. But the main factor, the main question they ask themselves, they want, their, they want the nuclear weapon, they want to become nuclear, but they don't want to find themselves in a direct military confrontation with the United States of America. They saw what happened to Saddam Hussein, how fast uh, Iraq uh, uh, collapsed. Uh, in face of the American forces in 2003. And since then they told themselves, there is one thing we are not, uh, 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 we are avoiding. Uh, but you, a, a that, you think that threat is just gone now? 
Ja, ja, look, look, andere, andere President Bush, George Bush, it was clear. They saw him uh, going uh, to, to Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, they, they felt the threat. They felt threatened. Under Obama, uh, Obama made it very clear that the military option is on the table. He gave order to develop the GBU-57, the seven-ton uh, uh, bunker penetrating a, a massive uh, uh, ordinance and he declared it, yeah, he made it uh, very clear that this bomb was developed specially in order to penetrate the Iranian underground nuclear facilities if necessary. He sent carriers to the Gulf and the Iranian were intimidated. Under Trump, when Trump uh, gave order, decided to eliminate uh, Soleimani, which is de facto was number four in the Iranian leadership, they told themselves, with this unpredictable person, with this unpredictable uh, uh, president of the United States, we cannot take any risk. So even when Trump left the agreement, in 2018, they, they, they made some uh, provocations, but they didn't reach beyond 20%. 20% was the level that they reached before the agreement, I mean, in 2012, 2011, 2012, before the interim agreement. So they said, okay, there is no agreement. We are going back to the level that we enriched in the past. Only last year, last summer, they announced and then started to enrich Uran to 60%, which is extremely close to fissile material that is needed to nuclear weapon. And the only reason that explain, uh, Trump left the agreement already four and a half years ago, for three and a half years, they didn't cross the 20% threshold, only recently. The only reason is that they feel rightly or wrongly that the US military threat is evaporating. So and let me ask you- that they can do whatever they like to. So, okay, so given that, Eitan, uh, what, what do you think, um, uh, if the, let's say the U.S. is off the table in terms of trying to stop Iran, let's just suppose that's the extreme presumption. Can Israel with its uh, Arab allies, uh, you know, stop Iran from developing the nuclear weapon militarily? Is that your perception? I don't want to ask you, Bob, because I think that's too sensitive a question given his his uh, security uh, background. So I don't think, I don't want to, I don't want to ask him that. But I want to yeah. ask you. What yeah. First of all, uh, let me though distinguish between. Of course, it's there's a consensus. Uh, I think in in Israel and, and worldwide, not to allow Iran to the to to enrich uranium uh, beyond the levels that uh, Yuval has mentioned, uh, and that's that's a definite threat. Uh, Israel and also uh, President Biden has also uh, announced, and, and Israel too that we will never allow Iran to uh, have a nuclear, uh, uh, a nuclear weapon, nuclear bomb. Uh, it should be made clear though, even after the enrichment, they still will have two years or so to develop it, delivery systems and so forth. But it's clearly an imminent threat, which will not be, uh, not be tolerated by, uh, certainly not by Israel, I am in no official position to, 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 to make any promise, but Israel has already made clear that we are not bound by any, if there will be a new agreement signed uh, by, 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 with the US and other, its allies with Iran, uh, and this will not be, uh, if, if this agreement will not, uh, will not prevent Iran from uh, continuing its the enrichment program, Israel is not bound by this agreement. We are not a party to this agreement, of course. <coughs> it's, we have to remember Israel has, has Iran is, 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 a, is, a, is a large country, 80, 90 million people uh, uh, with a history and, 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 and capability. So uh, uh, um, a conflict, a military conflict with Iran, which is not led by the US is something with very grave consequences. I'm sure Israel will try to avoid that, but will not, uh, constrain itself not to do it because this is something, you know, in the Middle East, we say quite often existential threats. 
this is an existential threat for Israel at this, po at this point. And there is a consensus that we will not allow that. Whatever Israel will do, uh, people understand that Israel has the, ca the capability to, uh, to react to uh, an imminent, to an Iran, which is just, uh, as they call it, out of the gate to produce uh, a nuclear bomb. And Israel will not tolerate that. And I think on that, unlike so many other issues in Israel, there's a consensus. Uh, okay. that this will not be tolerated. And, and uh, how do you, Yval, how do you see the uh, Abrams Accord and the, uh, you know, what do you, you know, what's your assessment of the accord? What do you think of the potential is for relations with uh, uh, the Emirates and with, uh, you know, Morocco? And uh, I, I know there's been a long history of ex exchange with Morocco, but uh, Saudi Arabia, how do you see this, um, is this a complete uh, kind of sea change uh, that we're experiencing right now that we're watching? I, I want to add. Yes, oh, sorry, sorry. Yuval, go ahead. Go ahead, Yuval. I want to add uh, only one point to 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 what Eitan just uh, said. Uh, Israel, of course, said that we will never allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons, and this is our responsibility for ourselves. Uh, I want to add that in the past, you know, when I was still the chairman, the young chairman of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee of, in the Knesset, I met with Dr. Muhammad El Baradai when he was uh, the chairman of the International Atomic uh, Agency. And I asked him about Iran, what, what they're doing in order to, to prevent Iran from, uh, from promoting uh, and, and, and producing uh, nuclear weapons. This was in 2004. And now I'm quoting what he was telling me, the head of the International Atomic Agency. He told me, Yuval, uh, Iran is going to produce nuclear weapons. Nobody can stop them. And we estimate that it will take them approximately seven years from now. It was 2004. So in, you have seven years to prepare yourself because probably in 2011, uh, uh, they will have first nuclear weapon. Now, this didn't happen. Today, we are already 11 years after this date, and they didn't produce a bomb because they have faced many problems uh, in their nuclear facilities and many, many accidents. And uh, who knows? There are many rumors about, you know, about who caused those uh, problems and those accidents. Uh, so they are not there yet. I'm uh, emphasizing this because it, it to show that the world can do something, that you can do something in order to prevent a country like Iran from uh, getting nuclear weapon. Uh, still, they are making a significant progress lately. And uh, I won't go into Israel capabilities, but I want to emphasize, you know, Israel already destroyed two nuclear projects in the past, in its immediate vicinity, one in Syria in 2007, and one in Iraq uh, already in uh, 2082, I think it was 2081 or 2082, uh, the Saddam Hussein nuclear reactor. But Iran is far away from Israel, and the Iranian nuclear program is far more ambitious than the previous programs in Iraq or Syria or Libya. And as I said, this is a global challenge, channel, a, a challenge. And here I think that the leadership of the United States of America is extremely important uh, here in the Middle East and beyond if United States will allow Iran to, to, to produce nuclear weapons or even to become a threshold nuclear country parking only two centimeters of nuclear weapons, uh, this will be a devastating failure of United States of America a devastating blow to the United States leadership, a devastating blow to the United States policy, traditional policy that was emphasized once and again by, by President Obama and also by Biden, but mainly by President Obama, uh, that the United States is responsible to, to, to keep the world safety and to keep the non-proliferation uh, treaty in place. So I think that, uh, you know, I think that Biden is a great friend of Israel. I remember my meetings with him. He always defined himself as a devoted Zionist. 
Uh, it has nothing to do with his uh, 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 love and, and friendship to Israel. This is a global responsibility lying on the shoulders of the United States of America as number one superpower and the leading, the leader of the democratic free world. And I hope that the United States will make it clear that uh, they are not just talking, but they are putting on the table, as they have done in the past, a credible military threat in order to keep the Iranian at bay, in order to deter the Iranian and to keep them at bay. Okay. Now to the Abraham Accords, I yeah. think it's a great achievement, a great achievement, uh, 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 mainly attributed to, prime, to, to former Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I, I, I need to tell you an anecdote. At uh, 2015, I visited uh, in, uh, in the Emirates. Uh, and this was a clandestine visit because there were no uh, diplomatic relations yet. So I came as a minister of energy for three or four days. And I was exactly going down of one of the very high towers in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, when the telephone, my cellular telephone uh, ring and uh, it was Prime Minister Netanyahu on the line. And he asked me how I'm being treated by the Emirates and what, what, what is my impression from my visit. So I told him, and then he told me, Yuval, you know, I'm already working about it. Then in a few years' time, it will take a few years from now, we will have full diplomatic relations with the Emirates, and you will be able to go over there officially, and I will be, uh, 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 ever, uh, 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 I will be able to go there with the Israeli flag to official visit. So I told him, are you sure? You know, <laughs> six or seven years ago, it's look, it's look imaginary. You know? Are you sure that, that, that we are heading in this direction? He told me, yes, it will take a few years, but at the end of the day, we will have peace agreement with the Emirates and with several other countries. And yeah. it was right. It, it, did, uh, it did take place. Let, let me add one comment, though, yeah. uh, Larry. I, I agree with basically what you well said. What some, the Abraham Accords are, are, are worthwhile and, and important. Uh, they, what cements this uh, shift in the, uh, in the policy of the Gulf states and to some extent also Saudi Arabia and Morocco as well, is of course, uh, but particularly the Gulf states, is of course what we talked about before, the Iranian threat, uh, which cements this, uh, the, 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 their opposition and puts them on, uh, together with Israel, knowing the capabilities of Israel, I think they feel that this is a natural alignment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, uh, the Iranian threat. Uh, at the same time, Saudi Arabia, which is the leader of these moderate Sunni uh, coalition, uh, has is still, of course, go, walking uh, slowly in this in this direction. They have already opened uh, airline uh, routes and so forth over Saudi uh, of the Saudi uh, territory, uh, which is not unimportant, is, is is significant. But they said that they are going to uh, to wait uh, with full relations to uh, with Israel until the Palestinian problem is is uh, is is settled. Now, the Abraham Accords also put the Palestinian aspect, which we haven't talked about before, in a different perspective. It puts it on the back burner to some extent, yes? And you can see it also in the US policy as well and the Arab countries. But it, the problem is not going away. It is there. It has been postponed. It can be contained. And this is actually the word that is used by Israel, containment, hahala. The containment of the uh, uh, of the Palestinian problem, we, we live uh, reasonably uh, safely uh, in the, under the current circumstances. But the problem is there, and I hope that someday it will be addressed. But uh, and Saudi Arabia said, uh, uh, quite frankly, and uh, during uh, uh, President Biden's visit now, that they will not go full scale until that problem is solved. I see. Alex, do you have any additional follow up comments? I think we've uh, gone pretty much uh, through our time. Would be any, any views about the um, Middle East uh, that you want to raise with uh, Eitan or Yvonne? 
Um, I I was also I'm interested also in um, in relations now between uh, Israel and India, which seem to be uh, uh, stronger uh, than in the past. I was wondering if someone could expand on that a little bit. Uh, it seems like there's uh, some alliances being formed there as well. And yeah, it'd also be good to know, in addition to India, what the relationship is with China. Yeah, uh, China too. Yeah, in Israel. Yuval, Yuval, go ahead. Uh, let me start with India. It's uh, I think that Alex is right. It's uh, some kind of uh, alliance, uh, economic and also uh, diplomatic and even security alliance that was formed between Israel and India. Uh, as you probably heard, Israel is now number two uh, uh, um, uh, defense system supplier of India. After Russia, I think that Russia is number one because Russia is still selling uh, the big platforms, you know, uh, airplanes, tanks, uh, 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 ships, and so on. But in Israel is only producing subsystems, very sophisticated subsystems. But Israel became number two. And uh, there is a very strong alliance, economic alliance and diplomatic and uh, uh, security or defense alliance between Israel and India. This world, <coughs> uh, uh, this actually started already 20, 25 years ago, but it was dramatically enhanced uh, when Prime Minister Modi, uh, when Modi became the Prime Minister of India, and uh, he and Netanyahu uh, uh, actually bonded together very well and developed very strong and very warm personal relations. In my view, India is going to be a very important global superpower in the future, also uh, economically. They have the potential. They are moving forward, maybe less, uh, not, not that fast like the Chinese, but India is going to, to become a, a much more important a country and, and, and global uh, player uh, and, and stronger economy in the future. With, re with regard to China also, uh, we have seen in the last uh, 20, 25 years a dramatic shift in the relations between Israel and China. Uh, when I became finance minister in 2010, I was invited to, to China to meet with a finance minister and also with a deputy prime minister in, in Beijing. And uh, before of that, I was asked to open the Israeli pavilion at the expo in Shanghai. It was exactly the expo in Shanghai, and it was the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, event ever. Not just the biggest expo, but I think there were 72 million visitors. It cost about $50 billion, much more than the Olympic game in, 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 uh, in uh, Beijing. It was a very, very big event. And I have to tell you an anecdote here that is telling something also about, about Israel-China relation and the core of it. Uh, one day before my departure, the Chinese ambassador to Israel came to my office to prepare me and, you know, and told me that the most admired person in China nowadays, he, he asked me to guess. So I thought probably Confucius or Buddha he said, no, you will be surprised. The most uh, admired personality in China is one Jew uh, named Albert Einstein. This is the most admired person in China. So I told to myself, wow, we have all the Einstein uh, writings, all the Einstein uh, intellectual property in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, including the famous paper about the theory of relativity, you know, with the formula E equal MC square. And nobody is paying any attention. So why, if, if it's this is so, I'll take it with me to the Israeli pavilion. There was uh, going to be a big ceremony opening the Israeli pavilion, and I will present it there. So I took it with me. And in a news conference, I, I said that I'm going to China, and I'm going also to bring the Einstein paper on the theory of relativity, which is written in his handwriting. And in the middle of the paper, I took it from the Hebrew University, you see the formula clearly, E equal MC square. Oh. When I landed in Shanghai, suddenly I was amazed because it began to occur to me that something very odd and surprise, a big surprise is going to take place. 
uh, when the ceremony started, there was a special minister from the Chinese central government that came all the way from Beijing, flew to Shanghai, and he came to, I thought it, it's a, a big respect to me, but he didn't come to receive me. He told me directly, we heard yesterday that you are bringing Einstein to the expo, so we decided that the Chinese government should be presented with the minister over there. Uh, after the ceremony, they told me that it was live broadcasted by 24, all the channels in China stopped the regular, uh, all the TV channels and broadcasted it there directly, the presentation of Einstein in the expo. And they have had 420 million uh, uh, spectators. It was a record uh, wow. in China's history. When wow. I came to Beijing, uh, people already, you know, people already recognize me because in, in, in all the newspapers, the main title and there was big picture was Israel present Einstein at the expo. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there is a big admiration in China. Really, I, I was totally surprised to, to, to Israel, to its technology, to its scientific uh, uh, endeavor, to the startup nation, and uh, to the Jewish people in general. And this was the core, this was the core reason why the Chinese government changed its policy and encourage uh, Chinese companies uh, to go to Israel, to make business in Israel, to cooperate with Israeli, with the Israeli high-tech uh, industry, uh, with Israeli startups, uh, to the level that few years later, the United States became concerned on some aspects, <laughs> and we have to carve it in order to take also the concerns of the United States uh, into place. But the relation with China and the cooperation is, is, is with China and India, two, two uh, very big countries and two uh, Asian superpowers are very good, uh, totally uh, in contrast for what they have been 30 or 40 years ago. This is a big, big change uh, from Israeli perspective. So well, that's an amazing story. I, th I think it's a, a, good, a good place to bring this to an end, but I, I think it, it shows the importance of, um, of human connections and, and uh, human, uh, you know, uh, this, this probably could not have happened. Uh, you know, it sounds like you changed the entire relationship. Maybe you also, you know, Netanyahu maybe was, uh, was critical in terms of uh, the Abrams Accord and, and planting the seeds. So, so it, it does show you the, uh, importance of human uh, of human beings uh, to make a big difference to uh, the, the importance of Einstein at Einstein. least with regard to Israel China relation amen for Einstein no question about it so I want to thank both of you so much I think this is a, a really uh, terrific uh, exchange and uh, I think our you know listeners will look, learn a lot about you know where Israel is in terms of uh, its security issues, its development of energy, its economic uh, exchange, and uh, have a deeper insight into where we're going globally. Uh, so thank you so much for participating and, uh, and uh, shalom. Thank shalom. You hello, hello, thank and you thank you. All the listeners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Take care. Yeah. With Thanks my friend so Eitan. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. We'll be in touch. Thanks, guys.